How you doing? <laughs> that's, the best, that's the best I got. I can't. Yeah, I know. Listen. All right, settle down. <clears throat> uh, if you're new, some of these people have been waiting for that for a few weeks, and uh, I know it was underwhelming. So uh, we're in this series called How You Doing? We've been talking about some of the most common answers that we give to that question. We've talked about being busy. A lot of times people ask you how you're doing. You say, I'm oh, really busy. Uh, last week we talked about being tired. So a lot of times that's our answer. I'm just, I'm tired, mostly because I'm busy. And this week we're going to talk about being fine, that this is our, our common answer for uh, how you doing. I'm fine. We're good. Everything's okay. Uh, you know what fine stands for? I uh, learned this through a movie. Fine stands for freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Okay, so you write that down. You can use that. Oh, you're fine? Oh, so you're freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional, huh? Um, because a lot of times that's, that's, that's what's happening inside. We just, we just don't want to say it. So we just say we're fine. We have this script that uh, we all agreed on at some point in human society and civilization. We said, okay, here's, here's what you do when you run into people, you know, at church on Sunday morning or in the coffee shop or wherever. You say, how you doing? They're going to say fine, and then they're going to ask you how you're doing, and you're going to say fine. And then you go on about your day. Don't, don't make up any lines. Don't ad lib. That's just the script. Just follow it, and uh, everything will be fine, right? So that's, that's what we do. That's what we're supposed to do. The problem is, we're not always fine, are we? I mean, that's not always true. Sometimes, you're having a terrible day. And, but we say that we're fine. Everything is good. I'm okay. Why do we do that? There, there's a lot of good reasons uh, why we do that. M most of the time, it's because I'm not sure that you actually care <laughs> how I'm doing. I think you're just saying it because that's what we do. And if I were to actually tell you how I'm doing, it would probably annoy you. You'd be like, okay, no, I actually didn't want to hear all that. I just wanted you to say fine so I could move on. I, I think a lot of times that's, that's why we, we do that. Sometimes we feel like, I don't want to bum you out, you know? I, you seem to be having a pretty good day. I'm having a bad day. If I tell you about my bad day, then maybe you have a bad day. Let's just, let's just not worry about it. You go on and have a good day. I'll have my bad day. We don't have to talk about it, right? We do that. I think sometimes we're afraid that people are going to find out that we're actually weak or afraid or lonely. And we just don't want people to know that stuff about us. So we say, I'm, I'm fine. Sometimes it's something that's happening that I'm actually trying to forget about and move on. So thanks for bringing it up. I'm, I'm fine. I'm not actually going to talk about it. I, I'm trying to move on. So we have all of these reasons for saying that we're fine when we're really not and just going along with the script that society has written for us a long time ago. But is it really okay to keep saying that when it's not true? Is it okay to not be fine? I, I don't know. I, I think there's probably a, another couple of layers below this that we may not get to today, but uh, I do believe that there is some truth that we find in Scripture that can help us with how we're doing and how we respond to that question. So uh, the Apostle Paul, he, he was a missionary that uh, he became a, a Christian after Jesus had already died and rose from the dead. And Paul didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God or that he rose from the dead until he met Jesus. And that kind of changes everything for you. So he met Jesus, he became a follower of Jesus, and then he started this, to plant churches all over the Greek and Roman world. And then he would write letters to these churches because this whole Christianity thing was brand new. People didn't really know how to live this out. They're like, okay, we're going to follow Jesus. What does that mean? And so he would write these letters to explain uh, and encourage. And one of the letters that he wrote was to this church in Colossae. The letter is called Colossians. So I'm going to read from about in the middle of this letter as Paul is writing some encouragement and instruction to this church. In Colossians chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 12, 12 and 13. Uh, one person is excited. I appreciate that. <laughs> Paul says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving one another. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So 
uh, Paul is, is explaining, here, here's what you're going to need to do as you live out G- Jesus' way in community. You're going to need to be compassionate and kind. and You're going to need to bear with one another. You're going to need to forgive each other. Why, why would we need to do that? When we look at the way that we gather on Sunday mornings, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of need for forgiving people because I don't even know you people, right? I'm just looking at the backs of your heads. I, I don't have anything to forgive you for. Yeah, you don't have a complaint against me. I don't need to bear your burdens. I don't know your burdens. I don't really want to know your burdens, if we're being honest. But that's not how the church gathered when Paul wrote this letter to this church in Colossae. In fact, it, was, it probably wasn't just one church. It was probably several house churches that Paul's writing to because they didn't gather in large buildings like this and listen to somebody talk on a stage with a microphone. They gathered in people's homes and instead of sitting in rows and looking at the backs of people's heads, they gathered in circles where they could look at your face. And Paul said, this is going to get messy (laughs) because you're going to be living in close proximity to each other. You're going to be rubbing shoulders every day. You're going to be doing life every day and you're going to get on each other's nerves. Anybody been on a family vacation recently? You kind of take this life where you barely see your family, you know, maybe an hour or two here and there, and then you decide, we're going to spend every waking moment right next to each other for an entire week. Or if you're nuts, 10 days, you know? And if you're really crazy, it's going to be in a camper like this size, right? And you, the first couple days are usually kind of rough. Because you're like, I'm not used to being around you. And now that I am, I remember all the things about you that just drive me insane. Would you please step back? Give me some space. And so this was what Paul is saying. When you get in in circles like this, when you get in community like this, you're going to have a lot of need for compassion and patience and kindness. You're going to hurt each other, maybe accidentally, maybe on purpose. And so you're going to need to forgive. And you're going to need to bear one another's burdens. If, if that's not your church experience, then I would encourage you, maybe you're, maybe you're just experiencing church in rows and not also in circles, and we need both. So I would encourage you to get in a circle, but here's the warning, fair warning, it is going to be messy. It's going to be messy when, when we get together uh, and actually be real with each other because here's, here's what Paul is, is assuming it's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to be okay. Some of you, that's just a little freedom for you right now because you've been trying to hold it together for a long time and put on your smiley church face and let people know everything's fine when it's really not. This is a good truth for you. You may want to write this down or get it tattooed somewhere where you can see it. It's okay not to be okay. That, that, that's not just a truth that you find in the church. We find that all over our society. In fact, Burger King uh, discovered this recently, and they, they did a, a promotion for Mental Health Awareness Month in May. So they, they did this uh, packaging of some meals a little differently. They're called Real Meals. Has anybody been to Burger King and had one of these recently? No? Yep, yeah, that's what I figured. No one goes to Burger King because <laughs> there are other options. As long as Chick-fil-A is on the planet, I'm not going. Uh, But here's Burger King's motto. uh, No one is happy all the time, right? No one's happy all the time. So we're not, we don't need happy meals. We need real meals. So you can go to Burger King and you can order a meal based on how you feel. So you can order a, you can salty meal or a blue meal, or you can see some of those other options and Google it later. I don't, I'm not going to explain them to you. Um, So they want you to just know it's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to be happy. You don't have to, you don't have to be happy and, and order a happy meal. You can order a, a real meal for whatever uh, that's worth. And Paul is saying, hey, that's true. It's, it's okay not to be okay. Um, we want you to actually just be real in front of each other because that is why you're going to need patience, kindness, compassion, the ability to forgive others, to bear one another's burdens. It's going to be messy because of something Paul says just a few verses before this in verses 9 and 10. So if you back up just a few verses from where we just were, he says this, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So 
Paul says, before you became a follower of Jesus, before you decided to give your life to this resurrected Lord, you could kind of say whatever you want. You know, if, if, if you need to protect yourself and you need to tell a lie to do that, if, if, if you're just trying not to bother somebody else and you need to tell a lie to do that, you know, that's what you did before. But now that you have chosen to follow Jesus, you've given your life to Christ, you got to knock that off. You've got to be honest with the people in your circle. It's really important that you be honest. There, there are a couple of words in the New Testament that get used in this context a lot. Um, one is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy would be the opposite of what we're talking about. Uh, hypocrisy means to wear a mask, to play a role. It was kind of a, a term they would use when they were talking about drama. If you're an actor, you're a hypocrite. And that wasn't meant as an insult. It was just meant as this is what you do. You play a role. You wear a mask. You're pretending to be something that you're not. And the word that they would use that meant without hypocrisy, they would just say without hypocrisy, that's translated in our Bibles as genuine or sincere or honest. It means I'm going to take my mask off and I'm going to let you see who I really am. Paul said this is what Christian community is supposed to look like. Without hypocrisy, no masks, no pretending, just be honest. I love this quote from Andy Stanley um, because it scares me. Kind of adrenal adrenaline junkie. He says, if you're afraid to be real because you think no one will like you, bad news, no one likes you because they do not know you. Does that make sense? I'm going to read it again. I want you to really understand what he's saying. If you're afraid to be real because you think no one will like you, bad news, no one likes you because they do not know you. The version of you that you think people like is not real. Therefore, they can't like the real you because they don't know the real you. That's a little sobering, isn't it? I think we all have this need to be known and loved for who we are. But if we don't let other people see who we are, how can they possibly love who we are? We've got to be honest. Now, I'm not saying you have to go into the gritty details of your whole sordid, you know, life every time somebody asks you, how you doing? Doesn't that sound like an exhausting way to live in society? Like every time somebody asks you, okay, sit down, here we go. I'm going to lay it all out for you. We'd never get anything done, would we? We would just be all just complaining and sharing our, you know. So it's not realistic that we're going to go through this every single time. But we need to find a way to respond honestly. I had a professor in Bible college named uh, Bob. He just asked us to call him Bob. Uh, his name was, was Bob Martin, but we were, we were supposed to call him Bob. And as a freshman, when I started school, the upperclassmen would come to me and say, hey, go ask Bob how he's doing. I'm like, that's, that's weird, you know, okay. So you see him in the cafeteria, and uh, these upperclassmen are like, go do it, do it. I'm like, what is he going to bite my hand off? What's about to happen? And so I'd go and say, hey, hey, Bob, how are you doing? And he would say, I'm rejoicing in the Lord. And then the next day, I would run into him again, and just because I, I was curious at that point. Hey, Bob, how are you doing? I'm rejoicing in the Lord. For four years, every single time I saw that man and asked him how he was doing, he said, I'm rejoicing in the Lord. And at first, I was just like you, I was skeptical. I was like, no, I'm not buying it. No one is always happy. No one's always rejoicing in the Lord. I, I just don't believe it. And then I got to know him. I watched how he interacted with his family. I watched him go through difficult times. I watched him be around difficult people, like his students, like me. And I, I came to understand that what Bob was saying when he said, I'm rejoicing in the Lord, is not everything in my life is great. Not, he wasn't saying all the circumstances in my life are exactly like they want them to be. He was definitely not saying all the people that I have to deal with on a daily basis are wonderful people. He wasn't saying that. He was saying, I am counting on the goodness of God. I'm just counting on the goodness of God. Every single day, in every moment, no matter what else is happening, I know one thing for sure. God's good. God's good. And maybe, so maybe that's your answer. If, if you're having a bad day and you just don't want to go into it, you can say, well, I'm having a rough day. Or you can say, well, at least God is still good. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know about everything else, but I know one thing. God is still good. 
and I can rejoice in that. So I don't know how you answer this when you don't want to go into it, when you don't have the relationship, when you just don't have the time. But my encouragement is to be honest. Because, because, putting on the mask can become a habit. Not, and not a good one. And if we just start doing that on Sunday mornings, and maybe that's just how you were raised, you just, you just you, you smile at certain situations and you put on the mask and how do you know when to take it off? How do you know when it's okay to be the real you? A lot of us are more comfortable with the mask than without it. So I just want to encourage you, break the habit, be honest, burn the mask. Because this is how we be real with each other. And this is how we acknowledge that it's okay not to be okay and we're going to live in community. Here, here's the, the challenge for us is the reason why I don't want to be honest all the time is because I see a gap between who I am and who I was created to be. I, I know that I was made to be a person of joy and kindness and compassion and selflessness and I know that in any given moment, I, that doesn't describe me. That's not who I am. And I see this gap between who I am and who I want to be, and I don't like it. And I'm pretty sure that you're not going to like it either, and I don't want you to see that gap. And so I put the mask on, and I try to act like there's no gap, like I'm, I'm exactly who I'm supposed to be. I'm, I'm being kind and honest and compassionate and everything. And when the reality is that you know better, you know that there's a gap between who I am and who I'm supposed to be. If you spend five minutes with me, you know it. If you listen to a sermon from a couple weeks ago where I told everyone in first service that I couldn't wait to do their funerals, you know that I make mistakes. Some of you are like, did he? Yes, I actually said that out loud in English. It was horrifying, okay? Um, I think everyone has come back since then. They, you know, they took a break, but they're back. You know that I'm not who I was created to be. And so why am I trying to hide this? You already know it's true. It's just that this gap terrifies me. And, and if I'm not finding a way to close the gap, then um, I'm just, I'm afraid that you're going to know the real me. I want to show you a little bit what this looks like. Uh, my father uh, bought a piece of property with a building on it. We'll show you the picture of this building about 20 years ago and uh, decided to build a house out of this ruin. And as he got started, um, he had an engineer come by and check out the integrity of these walls. They're 150-year-old poured concrete walls, about 12 inches thick. So this engineer came by, and uh, this is the front wall, and the engineer noticed uh, as he measured and looked that the front wall was leaning out away from the rest of the house like this. And he said, well, you obviously you can't put a roof on a wall like that. You're going to have to tear that wall down and build a new one. And dad said, eh, maybe not. It, my dad is the kind of person, you tell him you can't do something, uh, and he's like, watch me. You know? So he said, oh, you can't, I, so I have to tear the wall down? I'm going to straighten it up. And the guy said, no, you can't straighten it. It's concrete. It'll break. He's like, watch me. So here's what he did. Uh, he took a giant beam of wood, and he put one on this side of the wall, and he took another giant beam of wood, and he put it on this side of the wall, and then he took a bolt, I'm gonna text my, test my dexterity here. He took a, a giant bolt, imagine this all on a much larger scale, all right? And he put the bolt through the beam, through the wall, through the other beam, and then he put a nut on the other side. And every day, uh, he would drive by this house that he was going to build into his home one day, and he would take a giant wrench, and he would tighten that nut one turn. He would come back the next day, and it would look like nothing had changed. The wall is still crooked, but he had tightened that nut another turn. And he'd come back the next day, no discernible difference, but he had tightened that nut another turn. And after a few months, he called the engineer back, and he did his measurements, and that wall was standing perfectly straight. And it didn't crack or break at all. And the engineer looked at him and said, that should not have worked. And he said, well, you told me I couldn't do it, so I did it. <laughs> so I said, I bet you can't leave a million dollars to your kids. <laughs> um, 
We'll see how that works out. <laughs> it's not looking good. Okay. So I think this is a good picture of what this looks like for us to close this gap. We acknowledge there's a gap between who I am and who I'm supposed to be. And so our frustration leads us to hide it, to cover it up. But there's no structural integrity in our lives as long as we leave that covered up. The only way to become the people we're created to be is to close that gap. Well, how do we do that? Well, Paul addresses this in this passage, in verse 10. Did you catch this? If we go back to verse 10, uh, he says, don't lie to each other, uh, but instead um, tell the truth, because you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Paul is talking about a daily continual work that God is doing in your life in partnership with you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit to close the gap, to shape you into the image of your creator, to help you become the person that you were made to be. He has offered to partner with you in closing this gap. Why is it so important to God? that we close that gap? Why is he willing to work on us every day as stubborn as we can be and as forgetful as we can be and as selfish as we can be? Why does he work with us every day? Because it's not just about you. It's not just about you. If we really are going to live out our faith in circles where we're looking at other people face to face and we're being real with each other and it's going to get messy, how are we gonna get better? Well, if I'm closing the gap, if I'm partnering with Jesus and I'm tightening that nut a little bit every day and putting that pressure against who I am and pushing myself towards who I'm created to be, if I'm doing that every day, then I am in a much better position to show you compassion and kindness, to forgive you when you hurt me, and to bear your burdens. And if you are doing the same thing, if you're partnering with Jesus to close the gap a little every day, then you're going to be in a much better position to show me compassion and kindness and to forgive me when I hurt you and to bear my burdens. You see how this all works together? This is not just about you. The importance of you closing the gap is not just for you because a church, a whole gathering of believers that is working together to close the gap, that is showing each other compassion and patience and kindness, that is forgiving each other, do you know what that looks like? The light of the world salt to a community that is desperately in need of the gospel of Jesus. If we're going to be a community that is salt and light to our world, then each of us needs to take a little time every day to partner with Jesus and close the gap. I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe it's just some chair time, what we call chair time, where you're sitting, sitting down with a Bible and a journal and just quiet and you pray. Maybe it's listening to worship music and really worshiping in your heart and in your home. Maybe um, it's serving someone uh, in a way where you put your, your needs on a shelf and you, you put somebody else's needs ahead of you. Close the gap. Listen, it's okay not to be okay. Just be honest and close the gap. Uh, about a year and a half ago, a uh, young man walked through those doors back there at about 8.55 on a Sunday morning. And I thought I recognized him. I didn't know him well, but I had never seen him without his family. So I took a shot. I was pretty sure his name was Lauren, which is an odd name for a guy, but he, he wears it pretty well. And I said, hey, Lauren, how you doing? And if Lauren was like most of us on that day where we're in church, so we put on the smile and we say, I'm good, I'm fine, rejoicing in the Lord, then he would have gone on with his life and I never would have known what was happening with him and, and maybe, maybe he found some help for his struggles and maybe he wouldn't. But on that day, instead of saying he was fine, when I asked him how he was doing, he said, not good. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's step over here. Let's, let's talk. What's going on? He said, my wife just left me. And I don't know what to do. I'm pretty sure it's my fault. So we began to pray together. And we began to, to talk about uh, the steps that maybe he needed to take. And he began to get connected with other people here in the church family who were an encouragement and a support to him. A few months later, Lauren was baptized into Christ. And he began to follow Jesus every day. Not perfectly, 
But he was passionate. He still is. A year and a half later, if you ask Lauren how he's doing, he'll probably tell you the truth, but most likely his answer is going to be something like, God is good. God has just really blessed me. All because on one crucial morning of his life, somebody asked him how he was doing, and he told the truth. What would that do for you? If you were able to look somebody in the eye that you think maybe you can trust, and you just told them the truth. Maybe you could close the gap a little bit. And maybe you could help our church be stronger, to be a brighter light, to be saltier salt for a world that needs to hear the good news about Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for inviting us into this messy community where we're going to annoy each other and need forgiveness and need compassion. I love the way you set this up because it gives us a chance to be real and to trust each other and it also gives us a chance to lean on you to shape us, to change us, to make us more like Jesus. My prayer is for my brothers and sisters here that we would be honest and that we would work to to close the gap along with Jesus and become the people that you created us to be, and that through us, God, we would see more and more people embrace a life of following your Son. And as we do this, God, we know that you get all the glory for every good thing, and we just pray that what we do from here on will bring a smile to your face. In Christ's name, amen.